Last Sunday, we began our new message series, Learning from Others How to Live with God. Pastor Okura started off this series by talking about Adam and Eve, the very first human beings that God created, who we all have descended from. Their blood flows through us, and through them we have all inherited a sin nature. We can see this sin nature lived out in our own lives and also in the lives of the people in the Bible that we will be looking at through this message series. At the same time as Pastor Okura shared last Sunday, we can see God's mercy and grace in his dealing with all of these people, as well as with us today. Today we will look at Cain and Abel and see how these first two offsprings of Adam and Eve lived in relationship to God. Let's open up the Bible to Genesis chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Here we see the record of the births of Cain and Abel. Interestingly, Cain meant, I've got him, or here he is. Some biblical scholars have pointed out that Eve might have thought Cain was the seed that God had promised in Genesis 3.15. Eve might have thought that the baby she held in her arms was to be their savior. Of course, we soon find out that this was not the case. It says that Abel was a keeper of, the, of flocks, while Cain was a tiller of the ground. Genesis 4, 3. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Here we see that both Cain and Abel presented an offering to God. Please note that it is not the type of offering that was important here, but the heart and attitude in which the offerings were presented. It is plainly stated that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. However, regarding Abel's offering, it says he brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. In other words, Cain gave from what he had, but Abel gave the best he could offer to God. Furthermore, the writer of the book of Hebrews clearly explained why God had regard for or accepted Abel and his offering, but rejected Cain and his offering. The clear difference was faith. Hebrews 11, 4 says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Cain's offering was given without much thought while Abel's offering was given by faith. God was concerned with the heart in which the offering was given and not just the offering itself. Cain became angry because he couldn't bear that his brother was accepted before God, and he was not. Cain was not well in his relationship with God, and therefore he couldn't look up to God. Genesis 4, 6 through 7, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fall? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. God confronted Cain in a loving manner by asking him questions so that Cain might examine his own heart. 
God made it clear that Cain would be accepted if he did well, or more specifically, was well in his relationship with God. Cain could resist sin and find blessing with God's help, or he could give in to sin and be devoured by it. As God talked with Cain, he also speaks to us so that we might look at the issues of our hearts. A humble response to such an encounter with God should cause us to seek his help in showing us our faults, to repent and make things well with him. Psalm 139, 23 to 24 reminds us, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. If you sense that something is not right with your heart, if you sense that your relationship with God is not right, or that you have an anger or hatred issue with someone, then come humbly before the Lord to have him examine your heart. Admitting our sinful nature and sinful tendencies before God is a healthy thing to do. Along with this confession before God, we must also desire to seek his help in leading us in his right and everlasting way. His everlasting way does not produce anxiety or harm to ourself or others. Sadly, Cain did not take heed of God's warning. Instead, he let his anger fester. Verse 8, Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Cain had purposed to kill his brother when he called him out to the field. No human being had ever died or been killed prior to this point. So Cain became the first murderer in the history of mankind. That the first person to be born into this world should become the murderer of the second person to be born into this world shows the sad reality of the sinfulness of mankind. Instead of holding in check the sin that was crouching at the door of his heart, Cain let the sin of hatred toward his brother take control of him, and he killed Abel. As God lovingly reached out to Adam and Eve after they sinned, here also God lovingly reaches out to Cain, who had sinned. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Like with Adam and Eve, God asked Cain of what he had done. Adam and Eve reluctantly admitted their guilt, but Cain tried to cover it up by lying. Sadly, Cain's response truly exposed his lack of respect for God and his disregard for Abel. In all actuality, Cain was supposed to be his brother's keeper but instead became his brother's murderer. Cain's murderous rage was inspired by his pride and jealousy. Based on Cain's response to God's inquiry regarding where his brother Abel was, we are left to wonder if he had any love of God in him at all. The Apostle John clearly points out the reason Cain killed Abel. 1 John 3, 11 through 12 For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Going back to the offerings that were given, Abel gave righteously to God because of his faith in him while Cain did not. The evil in Cain's heart pushed out God's love and disabled him from being able to love his brother Abel. Indeed, Cain's lack of love for God and his brother, which is evil, led him to slay Abel rather than to be his keeper. That is the lovingly care for him. 
Sadly, the same can be true for all of us. If we allow anger to fester, leading to unforgiveness, bitterness, and then hatred to take out of our hearts, then God's love will get pushed out. We should be careful not to follow in Cain's footsteps. Seeing that Cain did not show any remorse for what he had done, God pronounces judgment upon him. Genesis 4, 10 through 12. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You'll be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. The idea of blood crying out to God from the ground is later repeated in the Bible. Numbers 35, 29 through 34 describes how the blood of unpunished murderers defiles the land. Cain had defiled the land by spilling the blood of his brother through premeditated murder. It was already hard for Adam to bring forth food from the earth, Genesis 3, 17 through 18. But now that curse would be amplified for Cain. As a tiller of the ground, Cain will find that it will be impossible for him to yield any crops. Adam and Eve were driven from Eden because of their sin, Genesis 3.24. But now Cain would be driven from his parents, becoming a wanderer on the earth. He would have to wander from place to place seeking food rather than living a settled life. The harsh reality is that sin results in broken relationships and alienation. Genesis 4, 13 through 15, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. Cain responded to God's judgment with deep anguish. We see here that Cain didn't feel bad about his sin, but only about his punishment. Sadly, we see this too often in our society even today. Having been driven away from his family and from God, Cain feared for his life. At this point, some of you may be wonder wondering, what other people were there on the earth to kill Cain? Although only Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve are mentioned by name in the Bible up to this point, there would soon be many other children born to Adam and Eve and to their descendants. Also, if you read Genesis, you will notice that the people at that time lived a very long time. So Cain would have lived a long time as well. God did not want Cain to be killed by others. Therefore, God set an identifying and protective mark upon Cain. Here we see God's kindness toward Cain, even in the midst of his judgment of him. What thoughts have, gone, have come to your mind as you have listened to Cain and Abel's relationship with God and to each other? Perhaps you have thought of a time that you were angry at someone. Perhaps you have thought of a time when someone was angry at you. Maybe you have had some sibling rivalry growing up and can think of a time that you might have actually wanted to kill your brother or sister. We cannot dismiss the example of Cain and Abel's lives as something that is ancient or foreign to us. We see many other cases of sibling rivalry throughout the pages of the Bible. I think of Esau and Jacob, Joseph with his brothers, Moses with his brother and sister, and David with his brothers. Here in these relationships, we also learn of the right way to handle matters and the painful results of not handling matters in the right way. 
I want to share with you of my relationship with my sister. Actually, I want to share with you of how my sister came to Christ. My sister Ria, who many of you know, was born four years and seven months before me. She was the first granddaughter on my mother's side of the family, since my mother was the oldest child of six in her family. So for, so for four years and seven months, she had all the love and adoration of her parents, grandparents, and aunts and uncles. Then I came along, and suddenly her perfect world was messed up. My sister has said that she was okay with me for a little while, but after a while, she was wondering when I was going to go away. <laughs> of course, if I had been a good younger brother, then it might have been easier for her to tolerate me. But I hate to admit, admit this, I was a real brat. I wasn't a brat in the sense of being openly bad in my behavior. I was the kind of child that would say and do things to please the people around me, but often got under the skin of my sister. I said that I wanted to share with you of how my sister came to Christ. In my sister's teen years, she came to Christ because she really couldn't stand me. And because she couldn't get rid of her dislike of me and knowing that that was sin, she confessed that to God and turned to Jesus to save her. So you see, I did not lead my sister to Christ because of my good witness for him. Sadly, I was a thorn in my sister's flesh that made her realize that God's grace was sufficient for her to be saved from her sinful thoughts toward me. When sin was crouching at the door of her heart, she turned to Jesus Christ to take control of her life. To be honest, I did not even know about this testimony of my sister's coming to Christ until fairly recently. I am glad that I am still alive today to tell it. <laughs> Abel's life of faith in God and righteousness continues to speak out through the blood that he shed. The blood of Abel is mentioned by Jesus, and as we saw earlier, it is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. Luke 11, 47 through 51, Jesus is speaking. He says, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will set to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute. So that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Here, Jesus was condemning the Jewish religious leaders for their hypocrisy. In a way, he was pointing out the fact that their religious activity lacked true faith in God and was shown through their lack of respect for God's word. Jesus included Abel with the Old Testament prophets who were God's messengers. Jesus charged the religious leaders of his day for killing the prophets. That is for turning a deaf ear to God's word spoken to them. Sound like God's charge against Cain? As we already read earlier, Abel's faith in God and righteousness still speaks to us today. Hebrews 11:4 By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous God testifying about his gifts and through faith though he is dead he still speaks What does the blood of Abel speak It speaks of judgment for unbelief Amazingly, the writer of Hebrews brings Abel and Jesus together in their witness, specifically in their shedding of blood. Hebrews 12, 4. 
and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. The context is that there are many witnesses who have gone on before us who live by faith in God, but ultimately our faith is centered on Jesus Christ. We are reminded that we are able to come before God as forgiven sinners and made righteous before God because of Jesus' death on the cross, sprinkled blood for our sins. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant between us and God. The new covenant assures us of an eternal relationship with God through the perfect work of his son, Jesus Christ, and our faith in him. There are a couple of things that can be said of the contrast between the blood of Abel and the blood of Jesus here. When we look at the blood referenced here in terms of a sacrifice that is given, the blood of Abel has to do with the sacrifice he made, which was the first recorded sacrifice from man to God in the Bible. In this context, the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel, which was an animal sacrifice. As we look at the blood of Abel as a martyr who was killed for his faith in God, his blood cries out for justice to be satisfied. The blood of Jesus speaks of better things, for it speaks of God's grace and of sin having been judged. The blood of Jesus cries out, justice has been satisfied. Abel's blood still speaks out to us. I, made, I am made righteous through faith in God, not by offerings. Jesus' blood still speaks out to us and even more loudly. I died for you so your sins would be atoned for and you will be restored to a right and eternal relationship with God. Will you follow in the footsteps of Cain or Abel? Cain's life was one of bitterness, anger, and violence. Abel's life was one of peace with God, founded upon his love for God and faith in him. Through Jesus Christ, we too are called to live as Abel did. Let us pray. お祈りしましょう。